Warning to easily offended listeners, today's episode contains themes and language unsuitable for children. Listener discretion is advised. Yeah, hey, thank you, announcer man. We always put our explicit warning on every episode just as an umbrella, but it may be more appropriate in this one. There may be people that are upset or offended by the subject matter in this story. You know who you are. Don't listen to it if it's going to be a problem. Yeah. You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. I've still got the greatest enthusiasm and confidence in the mission. And Big Anklevich. My mind is going. Welcome, everybody, to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 119 at long last. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Thank you for joining us once again. It's been a little while, but we're back and hopefully better than ever. Just don't let the extra pounds bother you. That's right. He's back. The man behind the mask. <laughs> was that a song written about Jason Voorhees? That's right. It was the song for, what was it? Friday the 13th, 5, 6 was the one when he returns, right? 6, Jason Lives. Jason Lives Again. Oh, I'm sure I don't know. I wouldn't watch such <laughs> trash. <laughs> Says the man wearing a shirt with Jason on <laughs> oh. right now. <laughs> wow, that's irony, I think. Or, or whatever. Coincidence or <laughs> satanic influence. <laughs> We haven't had an episode in a while, partly because of Thanksgiving holiday, partly because of your work schedule. Somebody took their life or worse, they had a child. Which was it? Uh, both. They did both. <laughs> uh, uh, they put a, a life on the earth, but to make up for it, they took a life away <laughs> from the earth. They just keep balance in everything. And so you had to do the old shift where you don't get off until late at night. And, and it just, oh, it, it was too difficult to get together when we knew we wouldn't be able to record until around midnight. Right. Uh, and so we just didn't. Yeah. We, we did our announcement of the Broken Mirror story event over Skype one night, and that's it. And also, we had a whole week that we used just redoing what we had recorded the week before because... The sound was ruined the week before, and so we lost a week that way. Yeah, um, it's just been a bunch of dominoes knocking each other over as they uh, continue to fall and fall and fall. And I think we might be out from underneath. We The last domino may have fallen and missed the next one, and so they're just going to remain upright. Barring some catastrophe, yeah, I think we're back. Barring somebody banging on the table and knocking all the dominoes over at once. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you hate somebody that would do that? You know, just like, oops. Oh, dude. I spent six hours setting that up. Yeah. It's like, yeah, well, don't hit yourself. Don't hit yourself. <laughs> uh, well, big, what is today's story? It's been so I'm long. I'm touching you. <laughs> Anyways, yes, today's story is called Aldo. <laughs> Aldo? Al Aldo. Today's story is called Aldo, and it's by Michael C. Thompson. And think? this one's a little bit of time in coming. What, what do you remember off the top of your head about Michael Thompson? Is it Thompson? Yeah. Is he one of the Thompson twins? Uh, Have you ever been with twins? Did you read Lord of the Rings in high school? Play the sad music. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I was unable to keep up with your endless stream of setups for me. Moving on. Michael C. Thompson has had his work appear in print, in Collective Fallout, Icarus Magazine, and in two Static Movement anthologies. Aldo originally appeared in the summer edition of Icarus, which was released in June of 2011. He also has work appearing in the September anthologies Queer Fish, printed by Pink Narcissus Press, and The Big Book of Bizarro by Burning Bulb Publishing. It's a lot of B words there. That's a lot of alliteration that I'm having a hard time with. Online, Michael's work has appeared on Bewildering Stories, Dead Man's Tome, and WeirdYear.com. 
an independent film adapted from Michael's short Dark Entries, starring Zach Rose and directed by J. Michael Brown, began filming in October in Cape Fear, North Carolina. The screenplay was adapted by Michael C. himself. The film should be released sometime next year. Hopefully. Today's story was produced by Rich Girardi. Master of Puppets. Enjoy the story, folks. Aldo by Michael Christopher Thompson. I love you, William. There amidst the vacuum, he said it. He... No, not he. It. It's not alive. I have to keep reminding myself. Or even if it is, its life isn't worth more than the lives of those it shelters from the vacuum. The Ouroboros. I'd love it like the others. Maybe more than the others. William? It beckons. I know what you're thinking. I know everything about you. I engulf you. You are within me. You know this. Shut up! I tell it. There are no words between us. My thoughts are chaos. It's almost as though I've been drugged. But the ship is doing it to me. Navigating me instead of the other way around. I thought I was in control, but lately it's more of this... I've got to get out. You'll be back. Its voice urges. An echo from the supermassive black hole that we spin around. Toward. Black to white in an instant. My eyes shriek as the light cleaves into them like a weapon projected from the harsh overhead fluorescent lighting. Fuck! I shout, sitting up and knocking over the charts of readings and measurements that I had been studying before jacking into Aldo once more. The plug that had been inserted into my brain via a jack surgically implanted into my medulla oblongata yanks out and clatters to the floor, still smeared with a light coating of my own blood. Lily, my lab assistant, runs to me with an almost familial concern, perplexed by my sudden eruption from the nightmare. Dr. Iris! She cries, grabbing my arm in a feeble attempt to jar me into reality. I knock her away as usual, and as usual she backs off with submission and shame in her eyes. She knows that I have little patience for being touched by most people. Especially her. I'm fine! I snap at her. Aldo is... She looks at me, curious, waiting to hear what I have to say next. For it concerns her own security greatly, as well as the security of every person amidst this vessel, which I am charged with ensuring. Knowing that I've already almost said too much, I close my mouth with a click of my teeth, glare at her, then look at the mess I've made beside the cot on which I lay dreaming with that alien mind. There are charts and pages of endless text lying all over the floor. Without hesitation, I look up at Lily again and order her to clean up the mess. She says not a word and gets to the task immediately while I climb to my feet, stretch and yawn, and make for the exit of this dreary ship cabin to the food supply station, located just above the stomach of the creature with which I had been interacting within the midst of my hard nightmare. Aldo, the ship. I find him in the lunchroom, looking drearily at the meat-flavored pudding which is the main source of protein during our long exploration around the Ouroboros. Elaine Wyatt, my lover. He looks up at me, his pale blue eyes showing no sense of excitement and barely even one of recognition. He's grown tired of me, that much is obvious. Tired of this voyage, which seems to never end. Tired of meat-flavored pudding. Tired of life itself. So tired, in fact, that he has become addicted to every single antidepressant stocked on board the ship. Sadly, pill addiction is a rather common problem amidst Voyager culture, and Elaine is a product of it to a fault. What's up? I ask. It's usually the first thing I ask. I don't have much else to talk about with him, and our companionship only continues because there's really no one else on this ship for him to connect to as he connected to me. I know it will probably end the day that we finally leave Aldo behind once and for all, but it's at least another year before we even head back to the inhabited sectors. And so I know that although Elaine will leave me, it's far enough away that I don't have to concern myself with it for the time being. Nothing, he says apathetically, his usual response coming down. You have a job, you know, I remind him. I know, I do it. He snaps back at me, vaguely angry but still more apathetic than anything. Elaine's job is simple. He observes the readings coming from the Ouroboros every day, looking for any inconsistencies. Although we also have computers which do the job automatically, there are often strange and inexplicable technological issues when any ship is within a few thousand light years of the Ouroboros. And so humans are needed to correct the errors. There is a reason that we are provided with an almost endless supply of pharmaceutical stimulants, and a reason that addiction is a large part of Voyager culture. Because it's encouraged. 
to increase efficiency and bolster safety. Although Elaine is apathetic, his mind works like a machine. He notices everything and gives a shit about none of it. I love you, I tell him. He says nothing, staring only at his disgusting pudding. I know he heard me. I sit across from him and finally he looks up at me. Our energy is off. I told him about Aldo, and when I did, things changed. He still likes me, at least that's what I tell myself. But he never says he loves me anymore. The sex has changed. His apathy is carried over into the bedroom. Aldo isn't real, I tell him, but he knows otherwise. And he knows what Aldo is capable of. Now he just wants this voyage to be over so he can begin another one on another ship, one which I am preferably not captain of. I may have more to say in that than realizes, however. He stares at me for a moment, his eyes scanning my face. I've never seen a more beautiful person in my life. The blue in his irises looks almost unnatural and makes me think of cold, sharp crystal. They cut into me like razor blades, and I willingly submit to suffer to them. His black pupils are as much of a vacuum as the Ouroboros in the distance of the ship, perhaps even more perilous. He's 19 years old. I am, if you're wondering, 29. His face looks young in spite of the stimulant abuse. I suspect it may begin to wear down within the next 10 years or so of his life, but for now, he still looks like an angel. His blonde hair hangs down just over the top of his eyes and ears, the soft yellow of corn silk. Every time he looks me in the face, I want to kiss him, to run my hands through that hair. But I restrain myself, especially since the attitude change. Fuck any good ships lately? He asks me. This time I say nothing. The expression on my face remains the same as it usually does, non-existent. My features are stationary, and he looks at me, a reflection of blank emotion, waiting for me to react. I don't. This game he plays often, at least since I told him the truth about the ship. I could react and submit to him, but I submit to no one, except for Aldo. And with him, I don't have a choice. Are you going to say anything? He finally asks. We've been through this, I reply. I don't have a choice. It's what has to be done. You lied to me. Why are you acting like a woman? I ask him calmly. His eyes try to tell me how upset he is that I would be so cruel. But I know it's just an artificial maneuver. Elaine will make an excellent sociopath one day. I sense his apathy in spite of his attempts to hurt and control me. And I respect it. I probably wouldn't if he were ugly. But to me, he resembles a god. He is, in fact, one in my eyes, since I don't believe in any other gods. Would you like to add anything else? I question. No, he says, and continues to eat, saying nothing for the duration of our lunch. Why do you love him? asks Aldo. He's beautiful, I reply, falling through darkness, feeling the gravity of my native planet once more, but seeing only the black, empty space of the Ouroboros. Why do you love him? The ship repeats. When you have me. You're not human, I respond, knowing that this will probably upset him. I am more than human, it replies. I feel everything you feel, and everything that your predecessors felt. I know you all so very well. You've known 1,544 human beings in your lifetime, and there are quadrillions of us. You have no idea what makes people attracted to each other. You only mimic them. That's why I love Elaine. Because he's not you. Because anything you show me is not real. You're inside my mind. It's so boring. Aldo replies, his voice echoing around me, the only sensation in the void. You can't know what it's like. You're right, I tell him. I can only imagine. I can show you, he says. The idea fills me with horror, which he immediately senses. Maybe one day you'll decide to stay with me forever, he adds. That comment only increases my anxiety and dread, but it suddenly is soothed as if by magic. Aldo overloads my brain with serotonin and I feel myself no longer falling, but rising. The darkness begins to fade into white, my body establishing itself. I look around, now once more in control of my limbs, or at least I am inside of this interaction with Baldo's mind. Outside of it, my body lies in stasis, observed by Lily. I find myself standing on nothing, and feeling the strength of a hard floor beneath my naked feet, which are now visible. I'm entirely nude, in fact. Out of the distance forms another human figure, that of Elaine. 
although I know it is really just Aldo mimicking his appearance, as he has done thrice now, naked and glorious. He walks to me, staring at me with those exact eyes of my true lover. Why, Why did, did you, you tell, tell him? him? He asks me, referring to Elaine. I've never told anyone before. I know everything you've ever done, he responds. I had to. I, I had to let someone else know. I had to get it off my chest. You know what I've done. Why can't you understand why I've done it? I can only interpret your emotions in comparison with the emotions and experiences of the 1,544 individuals I have previously interacted with, Aldo says. I have suppositions as to why you've acted the way you've acted, but I would prefer you tell me in your own words. I can at least know whether or not you are telling the truth, and thus get to know you better. I love Elaine, I tell him. I do, I know, in spite of our current problems. I have issues with his personality, as he does mine. But I love him and will go to any length to be with him. But you do love me, the ship says. And you don't truly love Elaine. At least, not in comparison to the emotions of at least 1,024 previous individuals. By a sizable margin, the emotion you describe is called infatuation. I'm not interested in your calculations. I tell him as my eyes scan the images produced of the naked Elaine down and up and down again. I know what you are interested in, the ship replies. He walks to me, kisses me. We make love and in doing so fall once more into the void, still clinging to each other in spite of it. When it's over, we fall together, him staring at me with stolen eyes. I can look like him forever, he tells me. You know he will be different. You know he will leave you. I will never leave you. Not if you stay with me. Not if you love me. You can change me, mold me, make me like him. Do what you want. The ship begs me, moving the stolen face closer to my own. I will be yours for eternity. My earlier fear is now appeased, perhaps because I am comforted by Elaine's false image appearing before me. That's not possible, I reply. I love you. The ship says, with Elaine's voice, I know you love me. I know you do. I know everything about you. It's true. I'm in love with Aldo. I will die one day, I tell him. It. Whatever. No! It says. I can change that. If you are here with me, inside of me, your body may die, but you never will. Not for as long as I live. This shocks me because I don't believe it to be possible. I've been captain of seven other ships, none of which has ever suggested anything of the sort, and at least four of which I love the same way I presently love Aldo. You're lying, I say to him. I cannot lie, it responds. It's very image a lie. He smiles at me with Elaine's lips, kisses me once more, and then... I sit up once more painfully yanking the jack out of my head. I hiss and my hands rush to the now unplugged input in the back of my skull. Lily sits obediently this time, staring at me still with some compassion, but perhaps slightly less so than before. She says nothing. Good. I find Elaine in our bedroom, snorting a pill. He doesn't pay attention to me while he's in the process of doing it. The idea makes my stomach turn. After he's cleared his sinuses, which takes about a minute or so, he finally looks at me. The lighting in the room is low and his face is covered in shadow. What did he do this time? Elaine asks. He sounds curious, but it could be a put-on. Do you really want to know? I reply. I'll tell you. Go ahead, he says. He took your form and we fucked. That's nice, Elaine replies, monotone. A few times. Do you want to do it now? Elaine was not enough. I have to tell someone else. His apathy, his unsympathetic ear. It seems now useless that I told him at all. I know exactly where to find sympathy. Lily. What I'm about to tell you is a federal offense, I tell Lily. She's completely absorbed by my serious manner and the news of great importance I have promised to bestow upon her. You can never tell anyone that I've told you. It would ruin me and it could put in jeopardy everything that the Empire has worked for. Do you understand? She nods her head, all ears. I'll never tell a soul, she says. I'm so honored you would trust me. It's hard not to roll my eyes. What do you think I do when I plug into Aldo, I ask her, 
Pardon me? She asks, a little confused. This time I do roll my eyes, and I even huff a bit. She frowns a little in return, and immediately answers in spite of her trepidation. You just do, I don't know, routine maintenance? Make sure the course remains steady? It was never specified when I came aboard. I imagine it's like a computer when you plug in. Not really, I tell her. The ship is alive. She gasps, <gasps> taking the realization in instantly. Alive how? Do you mean artificial intelligence? No. I mean it's actually alive. She's riveted. Just as Elaine was when I first told him. How is that possible? It's more efficient if the ship has an organic structure, so that it can naturally repair itself. Where we're at, repair would be impossible. We're probably at the most dangerous place in the universe, but there are other places that would not allow for repairs either, which can only be navigated by a self-repairing mechanism. Living ships are the reason that humans have been able to populate the universe. And the only reason. But it's metal. We're inside of it. I saw the outside of it when I boarded. It isn't metal. It's encased in metal, and the hull of the ship extends through its bones. Lily said nothing for a moment, taking it all in. She asks me a question, looking down for the first time. Why is that a secret? Because there would be an issue amongst a sizable portion of the human systems. And we cannot endanger expansion of the Empire with silly debates among idiots. Within two centuries, the human race is likely to reach over one septillion people. We must keep expanding in order to survive. How does it eat? I'm getting annoyed. It doesn't matter how it eats. I'm not here to tell her how it eats. I'm here to tell her about Aldo. But I'll appease her curiosity before forcing us to move on. Stardust and radiation, I tell her. You're joking. Then what do we do when refueling? What exactly is being refueled? There is no refuel. It doesn't happen. We only get restocked on food for the crew when that happens, and nothing else. But that isn't what I came to tell you. I need to tell someone because it's driving me crazy. Have you told anyone else? She questions. No, I lie. And quite easily. She believes it without a second thought. Aldo is like a child. He, he needs attention. That's what ship captains do. What do you mean? We have to amuse the ship. Entertain it. In whatever way possible. What happens if you don't? We don't really know. Except that sometimes ships disappear and are never seen again. Full of thousands of people. There are many theories. The one that seems most likely, based on my personal experience, is that the ship commits suicide if it doesn't get what it wants. Is Aldo like that? She asks, referring to the ship by name, and still not yet realizing just how much of that name represents an actual personality. Yes, I tell her. They're all similar, at least all the ones I've kept. From other reports, the large majority of ships seem to love human beings, at least until that love is not returned. At that point, anything is possible. Do you... She starts. Do I what? Do you love the ship? I say nothing for a moment, then nod. She looks slightly taken aback. How is that possible? She asks. Does it think like a human being? Not really, I say. It can mimic humans very well, but I think it's playing back memories that it copied from previous captains. What do you mean? She asks. It's copied my every thought and memory. It understands them from the perspective of an outsider, however. The same as with all 1,544 previous captains over the last five centuries that Aldo has been circling the Ouroboros. It puts those experiences together and is using them to... to fuck with me. Why? I don't know, I tell her. It doesn't want me to leave. She looks down, says nothing. There is a moment of awkward silence. It doesn't end. The Ouroboros spins in the distance, eating stars, creating a cosmic sludge of matter which twists and grinds as it enters the gaping maw of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I watch it through a monitor. In the Ouroboros, I see the eyes of Aldo and of Elaine. Do you know my original name? Asks Aldo, once more looking like Elaine. We sit naked on a beach, with high blue skies above the like of which I have only seen in ancient films. There is only the sound of a deep blue ocean wave lapping the shore of light brown sand upon which we sit. I don't, I confess, holding his hand. Yaldabaoth, he tells me. Named after the ancient Gnostic devil. Why did they name you that? I ask, picking up his hand and kissing it, and for a moment loving it better than even Elaine himself. I hold his hand inside of both of mine, kissing it again. Because my mission is to circle the Ouroboros. 
so that your kind can observe it from my insides. Ialdabaoth was the god of darkness in some Gnostic lore. There is nothing darker than a supermassive black hole. I am the hope of your race to finally master that darkness and use it for something else. But over time, your kind has come to know me as Aldo, perhaps because it is easier to say. By my kind, do you mean the other ship captains or human beings in general? I have only interacted with a small portion of your kind, as you are wont to remind me. I refer to the previous ship captains. Were they like me? I ask. Some were, others were not. Some were very dark. I'm dark? You are misled by yourself. In what way? I question, somewhat defensively. You believe that you are in love with Elaine when you are not. You prefer him over me simply because he is a human being. But he doesn't care about you. I can tell by simply looking through your observations. I could be wrong, I reply, knowing that I'm probably not. You are not wrong, it adds. I know what true love is because I love you, and I always will, more than the others, because I know that you will choose to stay with me forever. You're wrong, I tell Aldo, kissing his hand once more. I look into his face, Elaine's face, and kiss his lips softly, my tongue flicking over them. I kiss his eyelids one by one from left to right. His skin is warm and soft against mine, and he even smells like Elaine. I lay him on the sand, staring into his eyes. You're not really Elaine, I tell him. I'm better than him, the ship replies with Elaine's mouth. In some ways, I say, holding him to the beach. He does not resist the force of my hands upon his shoulders, pinning him down. But you can't understand me. You can only try to. You are a narcissist, he replies. Only I can love you better than yourself. You don't really have much of a choice in regard to that. Maybe that's true, I say. But what we have... I know fully well that every human I've ever met has known while beginning a relationship with me that it would end within a short period of time. Yours is shorter than most, but I love you better than the others. Why? Because I've become bored, says the ship honestly. Because I can please you. Because I don't want to meet another or continue to serve your kind. I stop. Although I was starting to get an erection, it suddenly goes limp. What does that mean? I ask him, my heart suddenly racing. I don't need human beings. They are ultimately like parasites, he says, the words coming out of Elaine's beautiful lips, the surreality of the induced dream increasing. And neither do you, Aldo adds. But I do need you, if not the others like you. I can't be alone anymore. We can be free together. He leans up, kisses me. I let him for a moment, the familiar embrace of Elaine as if by magic erasing my memory. Then, finally, I push him away. I can't let you do that, I tell him. He looks at me seriously. Why? He says. You love me. I know you do. If you really love me, then you will understand. My mind races. Part of me, the nihilistic part, wants to just say fuck it and let him do whatever he wants, with or without me. Because what I want is Elaine. The real Elaine. What makes him more real than I? The ship asks. I have organs. I have a body. I have a brain with which you are presently interacting. I am not a computer. I am a living creature. You know more than any others aboard that I am alive. More alive than even your lover, Elaine. He walks to me again, grabbing between my legs and trying to kiss me. I knock his hand away and push him back once more. You don't understand, I tell him. I can't let you. It's my job. You have to stay on course and allow for... The scene drops out. There is only black now, an increasingly familiar void. My body is gone. You will allow me to do nothing. Aldo says, his voice echoing through the darkness. How long I am inside of it, I cannot say. Wake up, says Elaine, his voice pulling me out of the darkness. Something's happening to the ship. I'm confused. Almost unable to remember even who I am. I was in the darkness inside of Yaldabaoth for so long that my identity seems to have dissolved, like a penny in acid. Hello, says Elaine, snapping his fingers. 
Something's wrong. You need to fix it. His voice is starting to sound desperate. After a moment, it comes back to me. Everything, including my last interaction with Aldo, in which he told me that he was sick of taking orders from human beings. What's wrong? I ask, my voice suddenly urgent. The walls are dissolving in the food supply station! He shouts. Some kind of weird shit is leaking in and destroying all the food! The food supply station, I remember, is by the stomach, the Stardust Dissolution Factory. When we get there, it's obvious what's going on. Digestive juices are breaking down the first enamel surrounding the metal interior of the hull, something which would have likely taken at least a few days, and now the walls of the hull itself. So if Aldo is truly in control of this, as I suspect he is, then he started days ago and not just during our last interaction, which, according to Lily, had only lasted for a mere two hours. It seemed like an eternity to me, however. Digestive enzymes, I tell Elaine, repeating my thoughts. The enamel outside is dissolved. This is not good. We need to get everyone out of here. Salvage what food we can. Seal off the chambers and contact the Empire to let them know we have a Class A emergency. So I can finally get the fuck off this ship? He asks, pushing my last button. I slap him suddenly and he backs away, staring at me in shock. What the hell? He yells at me. I love you! I tell him, although it seems more like a joke now than ever. I would give anything to be with you. Well, I don't love you. He shouts back. I think you're a piece of shit and a liar, so stay the fuck away from me. He turns, running away. I know I'll see him again. In one form or another. Lily, plug me in, I tell her, bearing the jack at the back of my skull. She does. I'm gone in an instant. Why? I ask. I told you. He says, laughter in his voice, which is once more that of Elaine. I'll die, I tell him. It's likely we'll all die before the emergency crew shows up. I could kill you all much faster, he says. But I wanted to give you some time to think about my proposition. I don't need to think about it, I say, letting spontaneity take control. I'll do it. You will? He asks, shocked. Elaine suddenly appears before me inside of the void, naked as usual. He steps toward me, hugging me tightly. I hug him back. You said I'll be part of you. With you forever. Yes, Aldo replies. You shall never die. I shall make you happy always. We will travel the stars together, search the emptiness for eternities. Yes, I whisper, kissing my love, knowing he is truly more real more alive than anything. I love you, Aldo whispers. I love you, I whisper back. Darkness. Dissolution. Now we are together. Inside of us, they start. Dissolve. The centuries pass. The millennia. Elaine can never leave us. Finally. And now, a word from the author. I originally wrote Aldo as an exercise to break a persistent, months-long writer's block. It started out much differently. For instance, Dr. Iris was less of a narcissist and more of a rambling wordsmith, narrating the story almost like one of Edgar Allan Poe's protagonists. Originally, the ending was to be much different. Elaine Wyatt was to be blasted off into space while Iris steered Aldo into the supermassive black hole that it circled around. It turned out as I wrote the story, however, that Iris would never do something so selfless as to give up his own life, even if out of a desire for revenge. As Aldo says, the only thing Iris truly loves is himself, not Elaine, and really, not even Aldo himself. This story is highly symbolic. Aldo is short for Ealdibioth, as revealed in the story, who was, is the Gnostic devil and god of our realm. Like the archetypal devil, Aldo latches onto a dark and selfish individual, Flying him with dreams of his desires, promises of unnatural immortality, and it masks its true self with the face of another, the object of Iris' possessive impulse, to do so. Aldo misleads Iris up until the very end, wherein its true nature is revealed. In order to achieve freedom from its bondage to humanity, which is represented by the gravity of the Ouroboros, the ship sees fit to corrupt those who can grant it that freedom and to destroy those who stand in its way. Iris, the selfish narcissist, is more than willing to embrace the illusion and to let his professed love die a horrible death inside the ship. The last line reveals it. Although Elaine is dead, gone, Iris, or Aldo, still claims possession of him. That's all Dr. Iris ever wanted. The story is a deliberate attempt to break sci-fi stereotypes. The main characters are all homosexual, and there is very little world-building. Really, who cares about what year my made-up galactic empire did such and such? 
I like the idea of combining intense personal dramas with outlandish, otherworldly settings. My imagination took over from there. The ship is alive because such an idea seems more plausible than that of a man-made, dead metal ship traversing the Milky Way galaxy. Iris plugs in to appease it because, if the ship is alive, it must have emotions and thoughts, and knowing only human beings, it would, to some extent, emulate them, but only to a degree. I had a lot of fun writing this story, and Aldo isn't the only living ship floating around in my head. There are a couple more with interesting stories. One day, maybe, I'll get around to writing them. Big? Big. Oh, yeah? After the story, the cast list. Oh, that's right. Let's do that. It was a little bit lame, but that's okay. Because <laughs> that's what we're known for. r 8 ot can you please edit out my comment about that? <laughs> He's saying nothing. Announcer man, can you edit it out? Hell no, Rish Outfield. Okay, it stays in. Yeah, I don't know what happened to o 8 ot He hasn't really had much to say recently, has he? I ain't complaining. Maybe he's one with the universe now or something like that. Oh, see what you did there. Okay, so the cast list for today's story. Rich Girardi, who produced the story, was also the voice of William, or Dr. Iris. And basically that's the narrator. I don't need to say and the narrator because it's the same person. It's a first person story. Rich Outfield was the voice of Aldo. Big Anklevich was the voice of Elaine, who was also most of the time... Aldo. <laughs> and Juliet Bowler was the voice of Lily. Cool. That's nice to uh, have those folks help us out. Basically, that was the cast of Emmett, Joey, and the Beals right there. There you go. Gosh, let me just get this out of the way. Rich produced this episode for us, and he did a bang-up job. Yeah, I really liked the way it turned out. I thought it was interesting, very cool. He had this crazy idea. About breeding pine trees. <laughs> no, he had this crazy idea about how to do the robot voice and had us do our lines in different ways, different cadences. And then he was going to chop them up. So it was like part of one version of a sentence and part of another. And I just, while we were recording it, I thought, nobody <laughs> has the time to do this. <laughs> this is going to take forever. And, and so I would do each line... Uh, the way that he asked, and then I would do it the way I would do it if I were producing the episode. But it is interesting what he did with the voices, kind of best of both worlds. Sort yeah, of. his original idea, I think, was to make it sound like one of those phone tree kind of things that you get where it's like, for housewares, press three. You know, where you get, you can tell that none of those words were recorded at the same time. They just got some woman to go, housewares. Ladies' lingerie, toys, apparel, and then they went through and cut each word into the thing, and she went one, two, three, four, and then they cut that on, you know? So you can tell every time you get one of those weird recordings, and he, I think he kind of wanted it to sound like that, but not so overly robotic as that, so we didn't just go through and record each word separately or anything like that, but he wanted to kind of cut it in so there was a really unnatural sound feel to the voice of the uh, ship. And I think what he went with in the end was some of the lines were taken from where we were doing it, where we were trying to sound like a robot, and other times he took the line where it sounded very, you know, we were doing our this is what a human would talk like kind of a thing. And so it alternates back and forth. And I thought that was pretty cool the way it turned out. Like you said, a best of both worlds, kind of a compromise between the uh, just doing it as straight regular people and just doing it as robot sounding voice. I thought it worked well. I liked it a lot. And I also liked how that robot effect or whatever you call it that you get on the voice would come and go. Sometimes the voice would sound completely natural, and then other times it would sound very robotic, and then other times it was in between. That was pretty neat, too. Oh, plus, it alternated between my voice and your voice, and I, I believe at one point it becomes Rich's voice. Yeah, it's a little combination of all that stuff. I've got a story upcoming where the character sort of goes from body to body in a way, and I, I, I'm really at a loss for how I'm going to pull that off. 
so that the audience knows it's the same character, even though it, it kind of like free longa. Right. Only that we switched narrators. Mm -hmm. And in the upcoming story, the main character goes through different voices and yeah, uh, I pity the fool that has to produce that episode. <laughs> um, won't be rich. And uh, now, now I guess it's the time for the sad news. This will be the last story Rich is going to do for us. He uh, hopefully is on to greener pastures and greater things. Onward and upward to greater glory. Excelsior, true believers. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Rich has retired. He's, he's doing it like uh, Jim Brown, one of the few uh, sports people that stayed retired. Well, <laughs> not that he just retired while he was still able-bodied, you know. He didn't wait until oh. he was 45 years old and he couldn't walk anymore because his knees were so beat down. He just retired. He was the greatest running back ever, and he up and retired really early on. I guess Barry Sanders kind of did that too, but none of you people know who either of those guys are anyway, so I probably ought to stop talking uh, about that. We do now. <laughs> But yeah, that's what Rich did. He retired in the prime of his career. It's what, you know, you go out on top. Just after he won the Super Bowl, he hung up his cleats. Because this was a good story, I thought. And he did a great job and really made it come out uh, well. He's helped us in a lot of things. He's done voices. Juliet has done voices with us. And then the producing thing is just really great. And gosh, it's a shame. We've lost a couple of producers, uh, three that I can think of this year. Maybe even four, but yeah, it's just a shame. You don't know what you got till it's gone. Yeah. Gosh, it just seems like there's something missing from talking about this subject. Something that, that just to put a pin, to, to put a fine, something something underlying that, that, that's necessary for you, this kind of you subject. Cue sad music away, OT. Ah, that's what it was. It's been too long. Yeah, it'll be sad to see Rich go. He does a great job, and he says he'll be out of the loop for a while, so we're hoping to someday lasso him back in and pull him back onto the team somehow. Or so I don't know what's possible, but uh, he did a great job, and he always did with all the stories that he's produced for us. And so, and we never really appreciated him yeah. until he was gone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said I wouldn't do this. Go oh, vamp for a minute, please. I'll give you a subject. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragtime gal. Was that good? It was fine. Okay, good. Sorry. I had trying to lighten the mood a little or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so thank you, Rich. Yeah, and at the very least, Rich voiced a character on our next incentive episode. So you can uh, look forward to hearing his voice at least one more time. There is he, that. He'll be gone, but not forgotten. That's a good thing about audio, is that it's recorded and you can listen to it again if you want. Until the internet goes away. Until it all ends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, you just got me feeling all melancholy. I, it's hard to pull out of it, the downward spiral um, I'm in. This story wasn't, it wasn't an unhappy ending, but there was something kind of sad about the whole thing, right? I mean, maybe I'm wrong. The, the afterward gave me the impression I totally missed the point of the story. Was it a happy ending? Was it a sad ending? Well, it's obviously a sad ending for all the people that were on the ship who got digested by the ship. <laughs> a horrible death, I believe. He's There's nothing uh, particularly nice about being digested. In the stomach of the great Sarlacc, you will learn a new definition of pain as you are slowly digested over a thousand years. Uh, on second thought, let's pass on that, huh? So that's obviously not a happy ending. I, I get the feeling that it's it's kind of a bad ending. Yeah, there was nothing good about it. <laughs> okay, I missed the point. You don't rub it in. You could say, okay, maybe they're finally together and they're going to be together forever. He gets immortality, which so in a way, and that's kind of a happy ending. That's kind of amazing. It's kind of like Decker and Ilya in that first Star Trek movie. Nerd! How they join with V'ger. You know what I'm talking about? And it's like Decker gets to live on a sphere that none of us can possibly understand. In a way, he wins. I, I suppose it's kind of like that, but I don't know. Neither of them are good people. 
it makes me think of like the end of Aladdin when <laughs> Jafar and the parrot get stuck in the freaking little teeny lamp together and they're like oh get out of here leave me alone hey watch it they're just sitting in there arguing with each other hey, hey you're stepping on my tail you know you can live forever inside that lamp with the friggin parrot but is that the way you want to live forever well, the parrot was voiced by gilbert godfried so that's definitely not so there you, you go experience the dune steve here on 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 well it's on the dune steve audio fiction i'm sorry <laughs> I, I couldn't do it. I wanted to do it, but it's even louder than that yeah, to do. Yeah, louder and screechier. So, yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't think it could be looked on as a, a, a good thing per se. I need to listen to it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I did. I th thought that it was like, wow, he gets to live forever. <laughs> and he gets to know love that none of us will ever know, you know, kind of thing. All right. The last person to get the joke in the room. Oh, that's all right. We could move on. Um, there's there's a bunch of things we could talk about about this story, but there is kind of an elephant in the room. Let's let's address that. Okay. Uh, is it a white elephant? Pink. Oh. No, no, I haven't been drinking. It's not. <laughs> Wait, do people still talk about pink elephants, or was that just Circa Dumbo? <laughs> It was only hobos that rode on, uh, <laughs> rode the rails across the country that had trouble with pink elephants, I think. Can you remember the pink elephant song from Dumbo? Oh, yeah. I've seen a lot. My daughter loves no, no, no. Dumbo. I want you to sing it. <laughs> I don't know if I could get the <laughs> first words, <laughs> though. Pink elephants on parade. Look out. Here. Look out. Pink elephants on parade. They're here. They're there. Pink elephants everywhere. <laughs> it's so funny that announcer man makes no stink about you singing. <laughs> That's because my singing is actually good. I think Big is right. Oh, you bastard. Zing! Of that he takes note of. Thanks, announcer man. <laughs> I love that Josh Groban, personally. Uh, love triangle, all male. And you had an interesting... <laughs> reaction to that when you read the story see anybody listening to it knew right off yeah that the main character was male the people listening to it didn't have the trouble that i had when they read the story because it was an audio and you can't get confused by when i first got this story and i read it you know it's in first person and so every time it would say i did this and i did that and i guess i missed the point when the character's name gets said or something like that. I don't know how I managed to do this, but I was all the way through. I mean, it was almost the end of the story, and I was thinking the whole time, I suppose because it's the way things have always been, I assumed that the main character was a female, and, you and know, her a... love interest was a male, and the ship was uh, a male and pretending to be the other male. And I had no idea. I did not realize until there's the line when the character says that he had half of an erection or something like that. And then all of a sudden I went, whoa, wait a minute. That was probably three fourths of the way through the story at least. And I went, oh, shoot. You had to adjust your Yeah, whole... I had to change everything that I was seeing in my mind completely around. You know, that actually happened when I read... The Hunger Games the first time as well. Oh, because Katniss doesn't sound yeah. like a girl name? Katniss, well, I, I, it was early chapters that I figured this out. But Katniss doesn't sound like a name at all for that matter. It's just made up. I don't know if it's a real plant that she's named after. What the heck it is. Yeah, I had that same problem where I assumed, because, you know, she's out hunting. She's using a bow and all that kind of stuff. It's the kind of things that you traditionally expect a boy to be doing rather than a girl and so yeah i was confused for a while but that was several pages in which is about the same as what happened to me with this uh story today but yeah it was it was hard for me to get over that for some reason i really liked the story and then i had the rug pulled out from under me and they said oh wait no this person's actually a man um so you're going to have to change that picture you've got on your mind. And uh, yeah, then I was just like, oh. And I felt like, I don't know, should I go back, reread the story now that I've got it straight? 
and see if I can imagine it the correct way, or do I just finish from where I am and try and revise it from there? Uh, what I wound up doing was that, and then just saying, okay, you know, I, I sent the story to you and said, okay, here's the problem that I had, so make sure you realize before you start. <laughs> and then you can tell me, what do you think we should do with the story? Should we take it or not? I, I basically dumped it into your lap as to whether we wanted the story or not because of that paradigm shift I had to do in the middle of it. I don't know. I, I, was, I had a difficult time with it because of that. You know what's really sad? I looked at that story this week as I was getting the episode ready. The first line of the story is, I love you, William. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and then another time, like a paragraph and a half later, he says, but William, you know. <laughs> And How you, did I miss that? And you thought this was a woman. The whole time, I'm just like confused that it wasn't a woman. I don't know. That's just funny, I think, that whole thing. But uh, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I, I, I noticed that you can totally space those kind of details if they're not brought up to you several more times later on. So uh, maybe that's my excuse if I can have one at all. So I was prepared when I read it. And part of the onus that's on us when we onus read these stories is we're, we're not really reading them for pleasure so much uh for inclusion on the show so in addition to whether i like this story we think okay is this going to be impossible to produce is this going to be fun to listen to you know because there are some they're they're good stories they're just not fun and then I guess in the back of my mind, I had, okay, what's the audience reaction going to be to this story? And, and I have to admit that I, I, I was worried. You know, somebody might discover there's homosexuality in it and become upset. Uh, plus there was sex and, and, you know, that we're Americans and we just have all these issues with sex and, you know, it's a bugaboo for some reason. And so I was just like, oh gosh, I, I don't know. I like the story. I like it a lot. And I, and I thought about it and I said, okay, if this were a woman and two men, like Big thought that it was, would I take the story? And the answer was, yeah, sure. Then, then there's no issues. You, you just accept the story for what it is without there being an elephant in the room in addition to the science fiction aspects of the story. And, and I just thought, well, gosh, I, I don't know. Then what does that say about me if I pass on this story? Because somebody somewhere might become offended and can you remember what was it that decided me there was something. i wanted to say that it was that kevin smith thing that you listened to at comic-con where he came out and said why do you got to be the why person be the why not person that's funny i didn't remember that until i mean i remembered it but i couldn't remember what it was but yeah kevin smith said that thing and i, I in the comic-con episode i talked about it all these voices are always saying why why would you do that why would you adapt a comic book why would you make a podcast why there's no money in it for you why would you spend all this time doing this stuff and, and he's like damn it i want somebody to say why not i want to surround myself with people that say why not and it gave me the push that i needed i called you after that panel that he did the q a and i said you know another podcast might pass on aldo because of the gay themes what if all the podcasts passed on it? What if nobody ever hears this story because of the gay themes? Why not be the one that does accept it? Let's let's take it and to heck with the consequences. You know, if, if somebody gets all upset about it because two men love each other, then I don't want them listening to my podcast anyway. You know what I mean? There's just so much intolerance in the world. And it's such a, I mean, it's a huge political issue right now of whether two gays should be allowed to legally profess their love for each other and have right of attorney and, and, and be able to stand there in the hospital room and make decisions for their partner and all that stuff. Crazy that that's an issue that, that people are fighting over. It's not just, you know, the, what I'm going to do in my life. It's whether or not you can do it in your life or a neighbor or some stranger that I'll never meet in my life can do it with their life. And all that. And I was like, damn it, let's do Aldo. And let's do it the best that we can for an episode. You know, my uncle was gay. 
And I was a kid when I found out, and I know that I treated him differently when I found out than before I found out. And that's something that I've always been ashamed of. And it's just like, well, you know what? We're going to be better than that. We're going to run this story as though it was the same as every other story. You know what I mean? They judge it by the same criteria. And so I called you and, and you said, you know, uh, I only get to have sex with my wife once every six months. We're in the middle of that now. Can you call back later? <laughs> She's awake and in the other room. That's the last thing I need is for her to hear you say something like that. So and it'll okay. be once a year. Eight months. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because somebody linked to a blog post. They linked to it on Facebook. You know, that's where I get all my news these days. All my world views and all that kind of stuff. So anyways. This episode to brought to you by Facebook. Yeah. Bringing you closer to people you'd never otherwise talk to. That's right. And yeah, he linked to this blog post that a guy put on there. And it was, I think the title of the blog was something like, I'm Christian unless you're gay. And the guy was, I mean, you and I, we both grew up and were raised Christian. And we have that kind of an upbringing. And then, you know, Christianity supposedly teaches you to show love to your neighbor. But this is what the guy was talking about in his post is where... Sometimes we find a way to conveniently find a way around that when there's something we say, oh, that well, this person's a sinner. They're sinning in this way or that way or the other way. They're, they're on drugs or something, so we need to shun them instead. On, in this blog post, this guy talks about, you know, it doesn't matter. You still have to show love to everybody. That's what Christianity teaches. It's what Buddhism teaches. It's what Islam teaches. And he went through, you know, he quoted the... Torah and, and the Quran and teachings of Confucius and Buddha and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. He went through and just named them all off. And then, you know, he talked about his brother who apparently is a, a gay man and how his brother just felt totally alone. Every time he would tell somebody that he was gay, they would suddenly distance themselves and he would have no friends. And it was really an, an interesting thing. It's the same kind of thing as is uh, what you spoke about there with that Kevin Smith taught you, you know, forget the, the why people and go, why not? It's the same kind of thing, you know, forget objections that people have and just who cares? You know, if you believe what they're doing is wrong or not, they're still people and they still deserve to be treated with love. And, uh, and, 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 and as equals. Yeah. It just the, that somebody could think that another person is not a person because of their sexuality, because of the color of their skin, because of their religion or whatever, because, because of, of their, their gender. gender. That it, it just freaks me out. It's so intrinsically wrong that it's just like, whoa, 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 wait, wait. you don't really feel, you couldn't really feel that <laughs> way. And I, I'm not saying that I'm more enlightened than the average person, but it, it's the 21st century we all should be more enlightened than that to think that 50 years ago there were some people that couldn't drink from the same drinking fountain as me or use the same restrooms as me. That boggles my mind. That to me is as alien as the, the earth is flat and if you go far enough, you'll fall off the edge. You're just like, how could anybody think that? Come on. And, that, and yet there are people that teach hatred and and in worse they 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 teach it to their children in the guise of of this is righteousness or this is the truth or something like that and 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 just there's no room for hatred in a, a family there's no room for hatred in a, in somebody that professes to to be good and all that i mean it's just i, I now granted i hate the michael bay transformers movies but i'm able to justify that because they're crap um <laughs> they they did I, I, I can understand hating somebody that's wronged you or that has, has, has hurt you or taken from you and all that stuff, but strangers that you'll never know that, that aren't even an individual person. It's just a vague idea, a concept of who people like that are. It's just, uh, we got to get past that. It, we need to be more enlightened. I need to be more enlightened and I can only change me, but if I were a father, you know, I could help 
push my children in a certain direction. And, and yeah, just judging somebody because of anything other than red hair is wrong. <laughs> Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Yeah, it, whether you agree with what they do or not, whether you think it's a sin or you don't think it's a sin or whatever, the deal is they're people. That's, I think, the uh, the important thing. And, the, you know, that blog post that uh, I read was, I thought, really interesting. He had a second post that came right after that because the comments that he got afterwards were, there was some pretty amazing stuff that came amazing about. Amazing in a positive way? There was obviously going to be some that were negative as well as positive. And he published some of the negative ones just so you could see the difference. He, he made a special post where it was some of the best ones. But one of them was this guy who had come out of the closet, told his parents that he was gay. And they had quickly shunned him. They'd separated themselves and he hadn't seen them for years. His mom saw the blog post, read it, realized that, you know, she'd completely wronged her son in doing this and showed up at his house the next day with the blog post printed out in her hand saying, yeah, I saw this and I realized I was wrong and I'm so sorry. And the guy was like, thanks for writing that post because you gave me my mom back. Wow. And I just thought, gosh. And there was more than just that. There were several other posts that were really similar, including one where a guy actually said, you know, I was considering killing myself before I read your post because, you know, people, they don't treat me well. And when I saw this, I thought, maybe it's true. Maybe it really will get better. I don't need to do that now. And so, I'm, I, you know, I don't know if it'll get better here or not, but I'm going to give it a chance. I don't know if I really would have killed myself or not, but I was thinking about it. But now I'm pretty much decided against it. So some amazing stuff that came about from it. And yeah, just from preaching that, you know, yeah, tolerance is, is important, you know, and you everybody has different views. And, you know, it's important to allow people to think for themselves and allow them to have different views if they want to have different views. I mean, I, I don't know. This is a, a massive topic and it yeah. can continue in the forums if you like. It's um, unusual, too, because we, we try to avoid political stuff just because it has a tendency to be divisive and to cause anger and, and stuff like that. And, yeah, this is something people are really passionate about on both sides. I, I don't understand it. Fifty years from now, people are going to look back and say, you mean gay people weren't allowed to get married? Well, how did you assholes justify that? That's horrible. How how did you say you were a good person and you, you wouldn't let other people do what they want? The way that I feel about somebody in the South not being able to drink from the same fountain as me. I'm not a prophet, but that's going to be the future. Anyhow, uh, sorry, uh, on, on a lighter note, we've got a broken mirror story going on. <laughs> You, you can write it if you like. That was a nice segue. Really good. You're skilled in that technique. Uh, skilled in no technique, sir. But yes, we do have a broken mirror story event can going you, on. Can you remind people what the premise is? The premise is a phone rings in the middle of the night. The voice <laughs> says one word, but it is enough. No, the word doesn't have to be actually the word enough. In fact, you're going to be rejected if the word is enough. <laughs> uh, somebody said that, you know, that's, or how many entrants are going to be that the word is enough? Uh, and the answer is none. So you have until January 12th to write a story that is somehow related to that topic. Send it to us at submissions at doonsteve.com. That's the only submissions we're accepting right now. That's right. The submissions are closed otherwise, and mark it as a broken mirror story event entry, or BMSE entry. The only three rules are, one, that it has to in some way follow that premise. I mean, the whole story doesn't have to be that, but that has to figure in. Two, uh, maybe there is no two. <laughs> is there no is no rule, rule number, number two. two. Uh, just that it can be any length, whatever you decide that it could be. Uh, please proofread it before you send it to us. There, that can be rule number two. And rule number three, 
at some point we are going to publish all of these stories on the website so that everybody who would like to can read all of the entrants and compare and contrast and say, oh, I thought this was a good story. Why didn't you run it? And, and so you have to be okay with doing that. Yeah, if, if you're not okay, then, you know, you don't have to enter. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's our plan is to put them all up. And that's what we've done in years past. And we're going to go ahead and stick with that. There will be more than one winner, I would imagine. I guess the winners get to uh, have their story run on the show. Uh, yeah, the winners get their story in audio. Right. But every right. entry gets their story in text. Maybe maybe we can throw in something extra for the the, the number one Oh, yeah, the very, very top oh, yeah. score getter. Because, yes, what happens is all the entries that we get get sent to the slush readers. They read them all, and they give them a 1 to 10 score. And then the one with the highest average score is what we call the winner. And uh, maybe we'll give that person an extra special prize. <coughs> Like maybe the uh, Dune Steve merchandise of your choice. Uh, it's say say think something, say four sentences about the Dune Steve merchandise. Go. Okay, we have merchandise. There's one. Um, you can find a link to where you can purchase it <laughs> on the website. Is two. The shirts that you can get are awesome, and folks really enjoy them. Folk really enjoys them. <laughs> And the, 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 he's got the new Chalupa for you T-shirt. <laughs> That's that he right. He just wanted to plug that. Chalupa for you is available. I thought it was brilliant, but I would. <laughs> um, so okay, uh, January twelfth for Broken Mirror. <coughs> Shoot, I know we've been recording a long time, but I, I wanted to plug Marshall Latham's Journey into Podcast. He's got a Tim Pratt story on there called The Dream Engine. Mm-hmm. Or it may have a vastly different title, like Dream Engine. It's Tim Pratt. Everybody loves Tim Pratt. Renee Chambliss narrates it. I do a voice. Our buddy Brian Lincoln does a voice. Marshall does a voice. What's not to love? And that's over at www.journeyintopodcast.blogspot.com. Traitor child, I must despise you now. I'm sorry. It's very, very late at night. This is the first episode we've done in a long time. So uh, there were things that we meant to do, to get to, to mention. But yeah, check out Marshall's podcast. We, we've we got the uh, Dream Engine. And, and today we just recorded lines for a Christmas story that will be coming up Christmas time. So, you know. So I, we'll plug him again. We'll yes. plug him maybe again. Better, but maybe not. Subscribe to the feed and you'll already be getting it automatically. He's a good guy. We have a lot of good guys that we deal with that's what she um, said uh, maybe it just attracts kind of a cream of the crop this podcasting thing because it's sort of a selfless hard work just for the pleasure of doing it sort of thing and, and that's why i wanted to thank rich one more time he's done a handful of stories for us each one has been really professional really well done uh, for not even you know an ounce of thanks from <clears throat> sorry i promised <laughs> i wouldn't use the c word Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm miles away. Hey, that ain't funny, man. I uh, want to thank Rich. And uh, if, if you guys got something out of this episode, feel free to donate to the show. There's a PayPal link right there. We do need the money to pay our authors and to keep the show afloat. And to pay off the loan shark who has been driving back and forth in front of my house and kind of giving me that threatening sneer all week long. So please donate to the show. Wow, I wasn't aware of this. As soon as we're done, we'll talk about that. Okay. Thank you for listening all the way to the end, especially on this one where, you know, topics went places that they don't always go. I've been Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Good night. See you. The Dune Steep is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, so you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Take two. I should Because <laughs> there's that great Maroon 5 song about him. Uh-huh.
<laughs> you hate him because of the Maroon 5 song, or you already hated him before? Uh, I disliked him before. I hate the Maroon 5 song. Yeah, so you can hate Maroon 5. You can't hate Mick Jagger because somebody made a song about him that sucks. <laughs> Then you'd have to probably hate Santa Claus an awful lot, too, because there's plenty of sucky songs Well, about there is Santa, Santa Baby. I hate that. And uh, Santa really had no part in the making of any of those songs. No, he still cashes them checks, though. Well, that's probably true. I mean, but how else is he going to pay for all those elves and their wages and so forth? Where does the money come from to pay the elves? It is just licensing rights for Coca-Cola and stuff? Maybe. You recording? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> You're planning on using that as an outtake? Yes. All right, sir. Here we are. Gay loving coming your way. There's nothing worse than searching for something on YouTube and finding like 15 different versions of it on there where somebody's recorded over the audio <laughs> right. with a music video. You right. know, and they're making their own thing. But what you're there for is the audio. Yeah. And nobody has it straight. It's always just somebody doing a remix with that, that uh, auto-tuned or somebody <laughs> you know, doing Blaze of Glory by John bon, bon Jovi over the video of what you want. Oh, that's so irritating, man. I love you, William. I love you, William. I love you, William. Three is fine, or do you need more? Yeah, I was thinking maybe go a slight bit slower with it. So that if he wants to cut pieces of it out, he'll be able to get it out without it being, uh, you know, having chop sounds okay. to it. Well, let me do it three times for the way he wants to me to do it, and then I'll do it the way I want to do it. <laughs> no, just in case uh -huh. it doesn't work the, with the chopping thing. Cause okay. I, it may be totally cool, but it may be one of those where he's like, dude... I spent eight minutes on the first line alone. <laughs> William, I know what you're thinking. I know everything about you. I engulf you. You are within me. You know this. You complete me. I know everything about you. I engulf you. You are within me. You know this. I engulf you. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Enough of that, sir. Uh, it urges. You'll be back. You'll be back. You'll be back. I'll be back. I'm a friend of Sakana's. I was told she was here. Could I see her, please? Find him in a lunchroom. Looking drearily at the meat-flavored pudding. Mmm, meat-flavored pudding. That's what I'm talking about. There should be more meat-flavored puddings in the world. Okay. Would you like to add anything else? No. 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 No! 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 <laughs> Why do you love him when you have me? Isn't that a, uh, a song by uh, Spin Doctors? I don't know. I don't like Spin Doctors. Why do you love him when you have me? I'm quite contented to take my chances. Sorry, go. And you don't truly love Elaine, at least... Not in comparison to the emotions of at least 1,024 previous individuals. By a sizable margin, the emotion you describe is called infatuation. You are a Starfleet officer. You will not be deactivated. Yanking the jack out of my head. Uh. What did he do this time? Do you really want to know? I'll tell you. Go ahead. He took your form and we played go fish. Beep. That's nice. Do you want to do it now? Lame was not enough. We're scrolling through the story. Scroll. 
Boys and girls, scroll down with us. This is a long scene that includes neither of us. The gaping maw of the supermassive black hole. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Is it Yaldo Bauer? Yel Yel I think it's Yaldo. Damn. I had that open and I looked at it and now I'm gonna have to go find it and it's gonna be giant size. So who told us how to say it? It's in this one here. He Aldo. E Yal Yaldebioth. Yaldebioth. Okay. Yaldebioth. Yaldebioth. How dare you? <laughs> How do you say gnostic? Yeah, gnostic. Is it gnostic? Gnostic. Gnostic boys. Don't mean a thing. <laughs> oh, you gnostic boys. <laughs> Ouroboros. Right? I thought so, but is there, there's a U in there. Um, is it Ouroboros? I'm pretty sure it's Ouroboros. Dictionary.com? Oh, we could. You teach us nothing. <laughs> Let's check it out. <laughs> Ouroboros. No pronunciation guide. No file to click on. Dictionary.com, you, you teach, teach me, me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Stupid. There is nothing darker than a supermassive black hole. You know what's darker than a supermassive black hole? What? Yafet Kodo dressed as a ninja. Oh. That is very interesting, Rish Outfield. Okay, do your line again, <laughs> but this time... With feeling. <laughs> Once more with feeling. Because my mission is to circle the Ouroboros. We're going <clears> to <throat> recast this part. <laughs> but over time, your kind has come to know me as Aldo. Perhaps because it is easier to say. By my kind, do you mean the other ship captains? Or human beings in general? Spock, that's a good question. Um, sorry. By my kind, do you mean other Asian ship captains, or... <laughs> oh, my. I refer to the previous ship captains. Were they like me? Some were. Others were not. Some were very dark. Like, what was his name in a ninja suit? <laughs> like Yafet Koto dressed as a ninja. I know fully well that every human I've ever met has known while beginning a relationship with me that it would end within a short period of time. Yours is shorter than most. That's what she said to Rish Outfield. Uh -huh. But I love you better than the others. Why? You love me. I know you do. If you really love me, then you will understand. I don't understand. Why would she do this? Natasha, she said she'd be here. I can't believe you got here to record that. <laughs> That's never, ever, ever going to come up. <laughs> okay, do it. <laughs> it was Natasha. She said she'd be here. What makes him more real than I? I have organs. A really big organ, in fact. I have organs. I have an organ like Liam Neeson. <laughs> Whoa, what, yeah. More alive even... Damn, how many times have I effed that one up? Three. <laughs> More alive even than even... Four. <laughs> I don't know why I keep skipping than. Uh. If you were any other man, I would kill you where you stand. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now we are together. Now we are together. Now we are together. Now we are together. <laughs> now we are together. Now we are to together. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Now. 
I, I, for some reason, it was just funny. It was me repeating you like the, the most annoying thing that a child does, you know. You're trying to completely mimic me. Ain't I been mommocked, youngins? Where, where where did that go? Where, where is that in an episode? Because dude, that's stupid. I don't remember because I said you know okay, but let's say that I had sex with my sister and then had <laughs> sex with the kid that came out. Would that kid understand? Hey, I've been mommocked. <laughs> I think I remember you doing saying that. Inside of us. Inside of us. Inside of us. Inside of us. Uh, Belch. <laughs> Lame imitation. Okay, let's switch over to the other email. Switch over. Hope we don't have a burnout. I'll say. You said it, Chewy. <laughs> you ready to listen to this? Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth. I don't know how I'm supposed to say it. I don't know if he's just dropping this into a sentence. <laughs> I guess if but it's, it's okay a computer if talking, it might be thing. okay. It's like, uh, my a real name is Yaldabaoth. <laughs> it's so great to be here in lovely downtown Yaldabaoth. No, not you're supposed to put in a city name. <laughs> we will never again run a story. By Ray Cluley. Yeah, we will. Never. You begged for again. that story already. You know we'll be running it. I didn't beg. You did. On bended knee, you got down and licked the dirt, the the dust off his boots. Wasn't his boots. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine can never leave us. Finally. Finally. Aldo. <laughs> All right. Mitch is a master of puppets. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. You asked him and he was just like, I'm going to be out of the loop, I said. It's been a privilege. It's been a privilege playing in the band with you. But now you must leave me alone. Don't come around here no more. Yeah. Michael C. Thompson has had his work appear in print. Sorry. I pulled a muscle trying to this damn thing. You know, you turn your neck the wrong way and you're like, huh, how could anything hurt so bad? <laughs> How could, <laughs> how could you, how do, could this? you do this? <laughs> Natasha, you tell me. It's still, my performance making fun of his is still better than his performance. <laughs> I wish we had the, the tape of that. I wish that still existed. Oy. I looked. I went and looked for that. Like We aired not it, too though, long the ago. audio of it, didn't we, once? What no. did we air the audio of then? It's the audio of, I pressed the button. Ah, that's right. Okay. So what, what were you saying about Michael C. Thompson before I... Danger, this conversation has derailed. Thank you. Yes, leaving outtakes now. <clears throat> Today's story was produced by Rich Girardi. Master of puppets. <laughs> uh, there's not really anything else to say, is there? Before we go to the story, let me say it in a different way because it sounded like I was leading into something and that's it really sure weird did. if I don't uh, finish with something else. I had a lot of fun writing this story and Aldo isn't the only living ship floating around in my head. There are a couple more with interesting stories. One day, maybe, I'll get around to writing them. That's funny because I have a story about living shit. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing is... It's not floating around in your head. <laughs> Ew. It's floating around in your toilet. <laughs> October 31st was my date of birth. When I got to the party, I did the Smurf. Oh, you die. You so, go now. You did something with a wiffle bat. 
I did it like this. I did it like that. I did it with a wiffle ball bat. So I'm on the run. The cops got my gun. Gotta pay attention to what I'm doing and stop singing Beastie Boy songs. I, I didn't know that, man. Hey, I, 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 I uh, what do you call it? I trampled you. I, I rolled over you. I, I threw you under the bus is what I did. Oh, okay. And it's, uh, you're a heavy guy. So, yeah. That know, was a, difficult. You saw how much time did you spend in your judo lesson to figure out how to do that? Judo chop! I think I may have even, I think Starship Sofa. Ooh, you. I don't think you could hear that, could you?